Hey everybody and welcome back to Sweatpants BI. It has been a while since I demonstrated alternative data visualizations that you can build in Power BI using the tools that are provided in Power BI Desktop. So in this video, I wanted to show you a, a really cool, in my opinion, variation on the common line chart called a slope chart where line charts are really useful for sort of demonstrating or visualizing, you know, the peaks and valleys uh, in a data point over time, you know, by day, by month, by year. Slope charts are really handy when you want to compare just the starting value and the ending value for different categorical uh, data values over time. For example, if you want to demonstrate just the change in a metric from a starting period to an ending period across all kinds of different categor categorical variables, we're going to be using, uh, I believe, states in the example that I'm going to show you here in just a moment. Uh, another important defining uh, element of slope charts is that typically you don't have to worry about like zeroing out the x-axis. Sometimes color is not important. If you have a whole bunch of different values in your uh, category that you're trying to visualize in the slope chart, sometimes it's okay to just let all of those values be gray and to just highlight maybe one or two values that you're interested in comparing against all of those other values uh, using color. So let's go ahead and jump into Power BI where I'm just going to walk you through a quick example of how to set up a slope chart using the line chart visual in Power BI and just utilizing a little bit of a DAX trickery to get the outcome that you want. So for this slope chart demonstration, we're going to be using a UFO data set that I've used in some other videos and that is available in several places to download uh, for free. And the reason that I love this UFO data set for the slope chart example is because there's so many years of data. You can see that the data set actually starts in 1941 and runs all the way through May of 2014. So, I mean, we've got the better part of a century of data in here. And once again, slope charts are, you know, for not when you want to visualize all of the different peaks and valleys and the variation, you know, uh, throughout a span of time. It's when you just want to build simple trend or slope lines between a starting point and an ending point. And of course, we wanna also build something that's super dynamic, which is why this data set is almost perfect for a slope chart example. And just to sort of highlight, you know, the, the benefit of a slope chart, I wanna do a side-by-side -side comparison here. And this is going to uh, depend on me having a year slider up here in the top left corner and I'm going to go ahead and go to my general settings, go to properties and advanced options and turn off the annoying responsive feature so that I don't lose any of my formatting here. Let's just go ahead and make everything in this slider large enough that you can clearly read it, read it. And you can see that my years here start in 1940 and they run through 2014. I think I've actually got one extra year in my uh, in my date table. Uh, that from what I need for the data set. The data set starts in 1941. My years for my date table start in 1940. Not a big deal, just kind of calling that out. So let's go ahead and build just a typical line chart over here because I really want to do this side-by-side -side comparison uh, when we're done. I'm going to add my years to the x-axis. I'm going to go up here and grab my sightings measure from my measures table. And this is just a count of all of the rows in my UFO data set. Every row represents one unique sighting. So this is perfect. I think that there are something like, yeah, 80, almost uh, 81,000 sightings in this data. So let's go ahead and just drop this into our line chart here. You know, at a glance, you can see, you know, maybe a slight uptick starts in the early 60s. You know, things are just kind of going along. And then around the 1990s, everything just takes off until by the time you get to 2012, you've got almost 6,320 sightings just in that year. So really impressive, you know, explosion here. And what we would be trying to do with a slope chart is really distill this trend to a starting period and an ending period. But let's go ahead and add one more layer of interest from our data 
let's just go ahead and add our state column over here to our legend. And now we get a line chart that looks like what I call a spaghetti chart, which I probably picked up from someone else. I don't, I, I feel like, I feel like some, someone else or something that I read called this a spaghetti chart and it just kind of stuck with me, but you can see why it's called that. You just end up with this C, this noise of lines. It's very chaotic. I would argue that you can definitely still kind of see the explosion here in the 1990s. But with everything broken down by state, it's really hard to contextualize um, or, or, or sort of understand what the uh, what the takeoff in the trend looks like as a whole because it's been dissected into so many, you know, uh, with you know about fifty states of uh, of values being broken down here. So you just end up with this really messy sea of noise here. And what we want to try to do is we want to build a slope chart that makes it a little bit easier to sort of interpret, uh, you know, the uh, change in this time span for uh, all of these different categorical values. Now, you're going to notice all of the colors here breaking down each state into its own uniquely colored line. One thing with slope charts to keep in mind is that this isn't necessarily as important. It, it, in, the, in the context of a slope chart, it's actually okay if a lot of these lines are the same color because what we're going to do is we're going to, to pick the lines that we think are most worth, um, you know, sort of calling out. Uh, and we're also going to be, instead of using legends, using series labels to make, you know, our uh, eventual slope chart a little bit easier to discern here. But what I'm also going to do just real quickly is I'm going to add another slicer over here for my state values. Let's go ahead and change this to a drop down list. I'm also going to make all of my items here in my header a little bit larger. And now I'm just going to go through and the reason that I'm um, going to do this is because otherwise you're going to see me format all 50 states and it's going to be a little bit boring. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hold down control and I'm going to go through this and I'm just going to manually select a handful of values from this. doesn't really matter how many I pick. I'm just trying to run through and grab a large number of values. And I'm deliberately not picking some of the states in here that I know only have a fairly small number of UFO sightings. But you can see I'm still picking quite a few. So, okay, we've got, you know, a slightly truncated version of our line chart with only, you know, maybe 20 or 30 states selected instead of all 50. Now, I want, I'm going to go ahead and add a table onto this because I really want you to be able to understand what the measure we're creating does uh, for our slope chart. So first, I'm going to go ahead and just grab year from my data. Right now it's aggregated, that's nonsense. Let's go ahead and click on this caret and instead of showing the sum of year, which makes no sense, let's choose don't summarize. And you can see everything is sorted here from 1940 all the way to 2014. As I get older, my vision becomes crappier. So let's go ahead and just make this a little bit larger. And let's go ahead and dump our UFO sightings into the table here. And you can see that our sightings for this batch of states start in 1942 and run all the way through the end of the data set in 2014. So what we want to do for our slope chart is we want to isolate just the number of sightings on the earliest year and the number of sightings on the latest year. So really we want to effectively capture just the two here and the 1378 here. And I'm even going to drag my slider a little bit so that we can get a little bit more uh, data. Let me go ahead and just try to drag this into the 60s. And I'm even going to pull this down to 2008. So we're going to try to capture 103, which is the earliest year that we have selected, and 2726, which is the latest year that we have selected, 2008. So first, let's go ahead and create a measure that isolates the minimum year over here. Or in other words, it's going to grab this 1967. So let's call this first year. 
And for this, we're going to calculate the, the minimum year from our date table for all selected values in our dates table. And if I've done this correctly, when we drop first year into the table, you're going to see 1967, the minimum year, but we're going to see that year for all selected values in our date table. So we've got 1967 all the way down, which is actually exactly what we want here. Now I'm going to just create a new measure here and it doesn't look like my measure came over, but that's fine. I'm just going to create that measure. I need to go back to first year. Let's go ahead and copy that and we're going to just paste it here. This measure is going to be exactly the same as our first year measure. It's just instead of using min, we're going to use max this time. And of course, our max year for all selected dates in our date table based on the current filter context, which is 1967 through 2008, that's what you get with all selected, is going to be 2008. I'm going to drop this into my table, and now you can see that I've got 1967 all the way down and 2008 all the way down. Because I'm using all selected, I'm able to pass filter criteria to, through to these measures. In other words, if I want to change this to from 2008 to 2010, now I'm getting 2010 and 2010 is added. Or if instead of seeing 1967, I want to just see 1979, now I've got 1979 through here. So now that we have these two, we can calculate a different version of our sightings measure that we're going to need for our slope chart because we're not going to want to use this sightings measure. We're going to create a new measure that I'm going to call sightings slope chart. And for this version, we're going to use the switch function. And switch is just like an if then statement. We're, we're going to switch the values when a, when a given criteria is true. So the first criteria is going to be if whatever year we're evaluating in this table, for example, 1979, 1980, 1981, 82, if the selected year being evaluated is equal to our first year, which is only going to be this row here, then return my sightings measure. If the selected value of the year equals last year, which is going to be just this row here where 2010 equals 2010, you can see all of the other rows that would not be true. If 2010 equals 2010, then return sightings. Otherwise, return a big old blank. Now, notice what happens when I drop this sighting slope chart measure in. I've got 129 for 1979, and I've got 2,461 for 2010. So let's very quickly go ahead and format this correctly so that the uh, comma is in there. And now notice that this measure is dynamic. If I go up to my slider here and if I change this to 2007, now I've got 2448. 129, if I change this to 1977, I've got 132. So my slope chart measure is already working perfectly. It's just pulling the value for the first period and the last period. Let's go ahead and create a new line chart here. I'm going to make it nice and large. And I'm going to use year on my x-axis. I'm going to use sightings slope chart on my y-axis. And you can see I've just got a starting period and an ending period. Let's go ahead and add state now to my legend. And this is exactly what I was expecting to see here. I only have values for 1977, which is what I've got as the first year in my slider here, and values in 2007, which is the last value here. I have years still on my x-axis, but notice that if I hover over these lines, I don't see a tooltip. I only have my first year and my last year visualized. So let's go ahead now and format this to make it a little bit more slope charty, I guess. 
Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of these years that aren't being visualized. This is a very simple change in the line chart. All we're going to do is just go to Format Your Visual, open up our x-axis settings. I'm going to make my x-axis a little bit larger real fast. I'm going to turn off my title because I don't need to see year. It's obvious that these are years. So let's just go ahead and turn that off. And now instead of using a continuous x-axis, I'm going to use a categorical x-axis. And this immediately gets rid of all the years that I'm not visualizing. Now you will notice that it also swapped the order of the years from, from uh, now I'm seeing 2007 first and 1977 last. That's obviously not what I want to see here. So let's go to our more options. Let's sort our axis. You can see that it reverted to our measure. Let's sort it instead by year and let's make sure that we're sorting it in ascending order. Now I'm seeing my slopes from 1977 to 2007. The next thing that I'm going to, going to do is let's go ahead and format our y-axis. Let's make the values a little bit larger. We're going to turn off our title uh, for our y-axis. And let's go ahead and turn off our legend. And I'm going to go ahead and let's just very, very quickly add series labels here so that you can see some of the states highlighted over here on the right. Some, Not all of the states in, for these lines are showed because uh, some of these lines are, tight, are packed very tightly together. So Power BI just can't fit all of the series labels over here. But there, it, there are some things that we can do to help with those situations. First, I'm going to go ahead and just pick DIN as my series label font. I'm going to make those a 10 point font. And we can also add a zoom slider to this chart if we think we really need to focus on some of this noise down here. So if I drag this out, I can start to see some of the additional states that are packed pretty tightly together. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add markers onto my chart just to kind of clean it up a little bit and make it a little bit easier to differentiate the different lines. And it's time to start adding some formatting touches to this, namely, which specific lines do we want to call out? Because slope charts are all about comparing, you know, isolated values within these categories. Right now, you can see this sort of sea of noise. It's definitely cleaner than the chart over here. And you can see the overall trend much more easily from 1977 to 2007. And all of the noise in between is cut out. But maybe there are just a couple of states that we really want to be able to compare quickly. So what we're going to do real quickly is we're going to go down to our colors for all of these different states. And just real quickly, I'm going to go through and I'm going to make them all just kind of this light gray. And I missed Florida. When we're done with that, now we can go back through and really figure out which specific lines we want to make sure we're calling out. So maybe with me living in Kentucky, I decide that I really want to call, call out Kentucky. So I'm going to make Kentucky's line just a little bit bolder. And I'm going to go into my line colors now. And I'm going to give Kentucky just a pop of color. And you can see that it's all the way down here. And maybe I decide, well, you know, I also want to compare Kentucky with California. So I'm going to go down and now I'm going to give California a pop of color. And I'm going to make its thickness just a little bit bolder. And maybe I decide just for the fun of it, let's also throw Florida into the mix. Now I've got, you can see, three states highlighted, and I'm able to really compare those three states even within the context of other states that I'm not directly calling out. But if I change my zoom settings, of course, I can still make some of those comparisons a little bit more uh, accessible. Now let's go ahead and go to our markers, 
and I'm going to go ahead and leave all of my less highlighted values in this five point font or, uh, or pixel size, but let's go ahead and go to California first. Let's increase its markers since we're spotlighting it. Let's increase the uh, marker size for Florida and let's increase the marker size for Kentucky just to make everything as easy to see as possible because especially in the case of Kentucky where there are several other states kind of overlapping, unfortunately we can't very easily bring a line that we're interested in to the front. It's still gonna be overlapped by some of these gray values but at least now it's definitely easier to see. The last thing that we're going to do to really call attention to California, Florida, and Kentucky is let's go to our series labels and instead of applying the same formatting as we are for the other series labels, for California, let's go ahead and give it a bold font and I'm going to use the same color accent. I'm going to bump the font up to 13. For Florida, I'm going to use the same color pop. I'm going to bump its font up to 13 and bold it. And for Kentucky, of course, I'm gonna do exactly the same thing. And just by accident, I'm going with basically a University of Kentucky Wildcat blue here, which is my alma mater. So go Wildcats, I guess. And now we're pretty much done with our slope chart. There's one more touch that we could do here if we you know, really wanted uh, you know, to, to make a slope chart that is uh, as immaculate as it could be. Let's go ahead and give this a dynamic slope chart title. And we'll, we'll just call this change in UFO sightings by state between whatever the first year is that we've selected and the last year that we've selected. And all this dynamic uh, title is doing is it's just concatenating or combining actual text with dynamic measures that calculate the minimum year and the maximum year. And we're going to go to our, our title options here on our slope chart. And we're just going to grab in our conditional formatting that dynamic slope chart title. We're going to make it nice and large. Sometimes I like to italicize my chart titles, and now we're done. We've got a perfectly uh, good slope chart here that I would say is, you know, uh, worthy of some of the slope chart examples that you might find in some really fantastic books uh, by people like specifically, I'm thinking, uh, Cole Neusbomber Knopflick, whose last name I'm probably butchering, so apologies. Uh, and also in a uh, book that I just recently finished uh, reading called Better Data Visualizations by Jonathan Schwabish. Both of those books talk specifically about slope charts, and in fact, they were uh, two of the first books to kind of put slope charts on my radar as you know really useful kind of simplified alternatives to your standard line chart that I thought you might find useful. So thank you so much for checking out the Sweatpants BI slope chart tutorial. I will see you next time.